Hi, I'm Nicole Dyer, and in this video from our office hours from Research Like a Pro with DNA, I'll be sharing a question and answer about autosomal DNA coverage and choosing a feasible research question. In Research Like a Pro with DNA, every month we have an office hours session where members of our course submit questions and we answer them. And this one had to do with the beginning of a research project when you're trying to choose a research question and you analyze your pedigree and your DNA matches, looking at how many DNA matches you have and how much autosomal DNA coverage you have of your research subject ancestor in determining if your research question will be feasible. This involves um, calculating the coverage through how many test takers you have access to their results, as well as considering how many generations from the test takers is the research subject. I hope you enjoy this video. Two, you're all asked to assess whether or not there is enough shared DNA to answer your research question. And so just clarifying what this means, is this referring to coverage rate? What other factors do you consider in feasibility? And then additional questions about coverage, what counts as coverage? And she says, of course, I count the kids I manage, but what about matches who are on platforms such as GenMatch or MyHeritage where I can view their shared matches? And I thought this was such a great question to consider. So I'm glad this was asked. <clears throat> so here are some factors when con considering um, if your project is feasible. So as you can see, I always ask, how many test takers do you have? And so if you just have one test taker and it's a distant research question, it's going to be more challenging. So the number of test takers is definitely something to take into account um, when the lesson asks to assess whether or not, or not there's enough shared DNA to answer the research question. You have to think about, okay, there's only one match on this line and only one test taker. So that's probably not enough. But if you add in another test taker and that other test taker has eight matches on that line, then now you have probably enough to work with. So I would say like just two or three matches might not be enough if it's a more distant question. And then adding more test takers should give you more matches. Um, so yes, the number of matches on the chosen grandparent line and the leads method analysis, if you have a lot on that line versus hardly any at all. And then generations between the test takers and the research subject, if there are 10 generations between your test taker and your research subject, that's not going to be very feasible to answer with autosomal DNA. If there are between four and six, that's much more feasible. Um, zero to six, four to six. I mean, when I say four to six, I mean, we'd like to have it a little bit closer than six, but you could possibly go up to six generations. And then of course you need to consider the coverage of the research subject, which goes back to the number of test takers. And this also takes into account if those test takers are from independent descent lines of your research subject. So if they're all through one child of the research subject, your coverage might be pretty low and you might need to expand to asking test takers who are from other descent lines. And now onto this section about databases with additional info, can you count them for coverage? So in my heritage, it's unique because it shows how much the shared matches share with each other. So it's kind of like you have this extra data point there. And then in GEDmatch, you of course can see shared matches by going to kits that match one or two kits, but you can also take anybody's kit number who you've identified as a descendant of your research subject and view their matches. So this actually is amazing for coverage. And then at 23 and me, they used to have advanced DNA comparison, but it's not able to be used right now due to the data breach. But this also lets you see how much your matches share with each other, which is amazing for doing triangulation. So some of these databases have this extra info. Can you count them for coverage? Well, let's go back to what the purpose of coverage is. The reason we calculate the coverage is to understand the potential to find new relevant matches, not the same matches that you already have in your match list. So unless you have access to a descendant's full match list, you won't be able to tap into that potential. So although these things are wonderful, uh, they don't give us those new matches except for gen match. So my heritage and 23andMe don't let you see 
the matches of your matches. You have to actually get them to share their results with you somehow. But at GenMatch, if you um, identify somebody's kit number and they're a descendant of your research subject, that can definitely help you increase your coverage within GenMatch. And remember that uh, coverage is calculated within each testing company separately. So you might have 50% coverage at Ancestry, but only 10% coverage at 23andMe, depending on how many people's results you have access to, to analyze. So one thing that I thought of while I was answering this question is that Wikitree is a great place to find descendants of your research subject. And sometimes people have listed their GenMatch kit number there because Wikitree has a very neat DNA system where you can enter in the tests you've taken, and then it applies that information to all of your ancestors who might um, be relevant to that test you took. So if I took a mitochondrial test and I put it in Wikitree that I did that, Wikitree would say to everybody who's a descendant of any of my mitochondrial line, Nicole Dyer took a mitochondrial test. You should connect with her. So that's a really great resource. Another thing, which is kind of rare, but something you might try is looking on Ancestry profiles at Ancestry.com. Some people have placed their GenMatch kit number in their Ancestry profile. And so you can look in family trees for your research subject and then look at the person who created that tree to see if they have their GenMatch kit number in their profile. Now, just in case you haven't seen Wikitree, here's a screenshot of one of my husband's ancestors that I used recently in a DNA project. And his name's Humphrey Arnold. And then over here, you'll see the DNA connections. And most of the ancestors I checked didn't have any DNA connections. But if you have a popular ancestor that has a lot of people interested in them and a lot of descendants, you might see something like this where there's a lot of test takers. So you can see here's two Y DNA tests that have been done by his descendants and several autosomal tests. And all of them say their GED match number. So if I wanted to calculate Humphrey Arnold's uh, coverage in GEDmatch, I could take each of these people, enter them into the coverage estimator at family, um, at DNA painter. And then I would probably get a much higher coverage rate than if I just used the people I've already identified and have who all descend only through Humphrey Arnold's granddaughter, Joanna West. So this is a great resource and I highly recommend you take a look at it and we can make it better if we all start using it. So going back to that question of coverage, I just wanted to show a couple screenshots uh, from a coverage diagram that I did. And when I started working on figuring out the parents of Barsheba Tharp, I only had 10% coverage. All of my test takers were my father-in-law and his two brothers. So I had three brothers all descending from just one line. And so my coverage of her was only 10%. And this is in the ancestry DNA database. Then I realized I needed to add more test takers. So I asked a lot of people to share with me through independent lines. Barsheba had a lot of children and this isn't even representing all of them, but it's representing most of the ones that did have descendants. So as I did this, I was able to increase the coverage to 37%. Here's a screenshot of the coverage estimator tool at DNA Painter, a free tool that you can use to approximate the coverage of your research subject. You start here and put in the ancestor's name and then you add the children. And uh, then you, oh, I think she was just selected. Oh, she's the next tester. <laughs> if you don't put in the death dates of these people, then it will suggest the next best tester. And so I didn't put the death dates in. So it thinks I can test Mary Dyer, but she's deceased. So after I put this in, you can see that it calculates it for you, which is a wonderful help because it is challenging to do the calculations yourself. So I had this hypothesis that Barsheba Tharp was the daughter of Lewis Tharp's first wife, Joanna West. And Joanna's tree was traced all the way back to Humphrey Arnold and Harriet Ann Smith. So I thought if I could find matches descending from John and Bathsheba, and matches descending from Humphrey and Anne, that that would prove my hypothesis was probably correct. So I needed to add some more um, test takers to improve the coverage of Joanna West. So I added these two, they shared their results with me and I covered 19% of Joanna West's, 
the hypothesized mother of Barsheba Tharp. And then I added a few more people got 21%. And that 21%, that change of two was actually really helpful because as you can see in all of my matches here, the people that 2% of coverage that I added, which I guess is just an estimate. Maybe these two test takers added more than 2% because they are the highlighted um, test takers there. And they added quite a few lines to my data, making it more probable that this relationship was correct. So these test takers were instrumental in finding more matches with John West descendants, linking Barsheba to Joanna and to her parents back to Humphrey Arnold and giving me evidence for my hypothesis. So never underestimate the value of increasing your coverage.